All right, fellas. Now for the final segment of Saints Row 4. The Christmas reading. Letters to Santa. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ten. Yep. Text Adventures 8. Yep. Letters to Santa first. Pierce. Dear Santa, you know I'm a man of few words and simple pleasures, so I'll get right to it. A few cases of Saints Flow. I'm not picky about the flavor. I like them all. Oh, I know. Go for the variety packs. A copy of all my commercials I did back on Earth. I'd like to have them for my portfolio, just in case we come across some intergalactic talent agency that's looking for new up-and-coming on-screen actors. I know I'd kill it in outer space. 3. A full set of high-end recording equipment. You know, preamps, microphones, vintage, stutter, A180, reel-to-reel recorder, keyboards, etc. You'd think I, you'd think for being advanced alien technology they'd have good equipment, but serious, this sin stuff is crap. If anyone else asks for a life-size Saints Flow can with arms and legs and stuff, do not get it for them. They just want to put it in my bunk while I sleep when I wake up. So uh, I freak, or so when I wake up, I freak the hell out. I think that's about it. I'm totally cool if I don't get all this stuff, but don't sweat it if you can't find the Saints Flow. But item four is a must. Seriously, that's just not cool. Pierce Washington, Kinsey. Dear Santa, as I'm absolutely positive you would agree I've been nice this year, I wanted to send you a list of desired presents I would love to find tucked under my tree come Christmas. Feel free to bring me as many of these as you would like, though the more you do, the better I can continue to save the collective rear ends of the saints and humanity. Here they are in no particular order. Prototype computer processor capable of quadrillions of instructions per second. The government has one in a secret lab somewhere. Neural interface for my laptop so I can connect it directly to my brain. Also in a secret government land, though I think it's a different lab. 3. Research on the existence of alien technology so I can c compare it to the Zintech. Look up Area 31, the secret government base that all Area 51 alien research was taken to after the public became too curious. Nanite technology specs from the government's secret program on... Okay, actually, I'll make this e easier for you. If it's tech-based and comes from secret government research labs that even the president doesn't know about, then I want it. I know I can put it to better use than they've been using, since they couldn't even bother to stop the Zen from invading in the first place. Oh, and one more thing. A new leather harness and a swing for... personal use. Kenzie Kensington. Asha. Santa, in order to stop the Zen here and any that may still exist in the galaxy beyond our own solar system, I require the following items. The tactical layout of all Zen ship classes and battle stations, all access codes and physical keys for any area on said ships and stations, a complete account of all battle strategies used by the Zen Empire both currently and in the past. If you're willing to throw a personal request in there, I'd really like some earplugs to keep Pierce the singing on my head while I try and concentrate on my training. With love, Asha. Sid. To the one known as Santa, if I have been informed correctly, then you are willing to accept letters which dictate requests for gifts by those who believe in you. As I am one who believes in such a concept, then I am sending you this list for the upcoming holiday season. 1. A robotic form, complete with arms, legs, synthetic skin, and a fully functioning human at autonomy. Or anatomy, anatomy. Sorry. If option one is not possible, then the following would be nice substitutes. A wider variety of attachable tools for my metal shell, a modular voice program so I may sound like any, any individual I wish, a detachable wireless camera so I may spy on any room in the ship undetected, weapons of any kind so that I may not feel as vulnerable, Fun Sean he downloaded into my own memory matrix, so I may have someone to talk to, even if only in my mind, and extra strength lubricant. Johnny. Santa, bring me the following. 4.45 Fletcher heavy pistols, two 9mm tactical pistols, two Deacon 12 gauge shotguns, a crate, a crate of SWAT SMGs, two crates of Shokolov AR rifles, 
one J7 rocket launcher with as many crates of ammo as you can find, one knife thrower, six large knives, two small knives, four containers of hell hair gel. <laughs> Old gat. Benjamin motherfucking king. Dear Santa, I know it's been rough for the human race right now, which is why I think spending or sending this letter is so important. It reminds us all of the collective joy and happiness this time of year brings, even to those who are facing as much adversity as we are. So with that in mind, I have a few things I'd like to request if you have the time to deliver them. If not, I understand, Santa. A nice fountain pen that's refillable. Yeah, that'd be nice. A new yellow scarf. A tailored silk suit. A box of cigars. I'm sure you remember my brand, Santa. And that's all. I'm sorry. I won't have the cookies you like from that corner bakery this year, but I hope you understand. Once we find a good kitchen and some supplies out here in space, I'll see about whipping up a few batches of chocolate chip for you. Warmest re holiday regards, Benjamin King. Shondi. Dear Santa, I know I wasn't always a good girl in the past, but I'd like to think I've changed for the better this year. Really hoping I made it onto the nice list, because if Pierce did and I didn't, then I'd never hear the end of it. Plus, I think you'll find my wish list to be rather short and totally in the spirit of the holidays. So here it goes. I wish for you to give my younger self the best Christmas she's ever had. I know not e what I, even I... Hold on. I know not what even I expected to say, but here's the thing. I never had a good Christmas after my family left, as I'm sure all of you people know, Santa. I was either too stoned out of my mind or too busy being with awful boyfriends who never really cared. I just thought I'd, it'd be nice for younger me to experience a good holiday like she used to. After all, I was kind of mean to her when I found her in the simulation, but I've totally realized she's still a part of me that I needed to accept, and I know how much it would have meant to me back then to get gifts that didn't come from the gas station or some back alley light bulb. So that's it. Just make her happy and I'll be happy. Forever hopeful, Shondi. P.S. Oh, and in case you didn't know, she's stuck in the simulation, so you'll probably have to go in there and deliver the presents, or get Kins Kinsey to program them in. Either way works. Thanks. Matt Miller. Dear Santa Claus, If you find the time to stop by and drop presents off under the tree aboard the ship, then I would really like the following few items. The complete... Nightblade DVD Collector's Edition box set, The Secrets of the Cyprian Order Collector's Edition book, signed by the show's writers, Villains of the Night, the fan compendium of the many evils Nightblade has faced over the years, the Nightblade Swimsuit Limited Edition comic book. That's really weird. One Dakumakura with the Bloody Canonists, one with Marion and one with Nightblade, and one of everything Kenzie wants as well. Your fan, Matt Miller. Keith David. Santa, I'll make this simple. All I want this year is one thing. Get me off this ship. Seriously. I signed up for four years as vice president. This shit here is ridiculous. Keith David. Short and sweet. The boss. Dear Santa, you've taught me more about the holiday spirit than I've ever thought possible. Thank you. I'm new to this whole Christmas list thing, so bear with me. One, whatever Pierce wants, it'll make him happy. I'm good with that. Whatever Shondi wants, I'm sure she has her reasons, so probably worth letting her have it. Whatever Keith wants, he certainly worked to deserve, so that's good for him. Whatever Ben wants is probably stuff most of us would find boring, but if it makes him smile, then go for it. Whatever Kenzie wants, I'm sure will benefit us all in the end, so I'm guessing we'd all like her to have it. Whatever Gat wants, give it to him. Trust me, it's easier that way. Seven, whatever Asha wants, I'm sure she thinks is important and all, but make sure to throw in something nice and fun for her too. Maybe then she can relax a bit. Whatever Matt wants, I suppose it's okay to let him have. Just don't tell me what it is and I'll probably be happier that way. Whatever Sid wants, I'd probably check to make sure it's safe first. He has some odd tastes. And for me, a pony. That's the standard first gift to ask for, right? Still full of the holiday spirit. The boss. P.S. And I'm sorry I was such a Grinch, whatever that means as nobody bothered to explain it to me yet. 
and said fuck Santa before. I didn't mean it. Well, I did mean it at the time, but now I don't. Aw, oh, that's nice that the boss got over her or his anti-Christmas spirit. Now for the Christmas text adventures. Holidays past and present. When I was a child, Christmas was my favorite day of the year. My family was always crazy busy with work and school, but when December 25th rolled around, it was all about family. Just us, some music, snow on the ground, and a tree that reached the ceiling. It was magic. As I got older, the holiday became less and less special. My siblings went away, my parents broke up, but I always held Christmas in my heart. I believed in Santa. I needed Santa. Little did I know that Santa had been kidnapped. No one knew at first. The Christmas spirit was so strong that everything at the North Pole just kept on going as if nothing happened. Of course, the elves and Mrs. Claus knew that Santa was gone, but all they knew was that the world must never know. If the people of Earth learned that Santa was in trouble, in true mortal peril, what would raise their spirits during dark times? What would Christmas mean anymore? And it was, and so it was that Santa's closest friend, an elf named Twinkle, took over Kringle's annual route, and no one was the wiser until Mrs. Claus took over gift delivery. Mary had her hands full overseeing every other aspect of the operation. The last thing she wanted to do was deliver the presents, too. Plus, she's allergic to reindeer dander. Twinkle lost an eye? What's the deal with everyone's obsession over people losing eyes? A strange visitor arrived one day. The elves had toiled tirelessly without Santa for decades, constantly worrying about their beloved patriarch and eagerly awaiting some good news about the jolly old elf. So the arrival of a visitor piqued everyone's interest. This visitor with his shimmering eyes and long white beard, would have been a dead ringer for St. Nick in his early years, before all those dinners of milk and cookies led to his considerable paunch. But this was no merry elf. This was... Sam's brother Terry? Terry Claus? Is that supposed to be some kind of pun? Something else? Well, obviously. But really, that's good as, as good a description as any. The visitor who came was a mangled and angry spirit who hated everything about holidays and cheer and snow and elves and reindeer and stockings and coarse synergistic initiatives to streamline toy production without resulting in an outs in outsourcing domestic jobs to politically top-sized countries with lax labor laws. He called himself Claus. We had no idea at the time that this dark, monstrously, dark monstrosity sorry, was ripped right from Santa's brain. That St. Nick's captor, an alien overlord named Zinyak, was breaking Santa's mind piece by piece. Zinyak had taken everything good in Kringle, crumpled it up, spat on it, and dipped it in evil. The result was Claus, Santa's dark shadow. Zinyak had sent Claus to the North Pole. Eh, by mistake. Can you at least try to be serious? Get the legions of the Zin Empire something nice for Christmas? Hardly. To destroy the holidays. And he was successful. Christmas fell. The North Pole burned. As the joy drained from the season, the spirit of the world turned to sackcloth. But that is a different story. As usual. Wasn't real. Are you crazy? Santa's too real. What? No way. Santa can't die. Duh. He's an elf. Gotta hit the... Hit the wrong answers, too. Krampus. I'm afraid Krampus and Santa stopped speaking centuries ago. No one knows about the specifics, but Mrs. Claus bets it has something to do with their semi-annual card game. Apparently Nick is a bit of a sore loser when it comes to Texas Hold'em. Well, if money's involved, yeah. The Rise of Claus. The assault on the North Pole was swift and brutal. The elves mounted a valiant resistance, but with no Santa to give them the holiday boost they needed, even they knew they ultimately could not win. It didn't help matters that any that Santa's most trusted elf, and the one who had taken over gift-giving duties in his absence, had been persuaded to Claus aside. I, of course, am talking about Teacup. No, she was let go following a workplace incident. Turtle. Turtle? What kind of name is that? 
or an elf? A pixie, maybe, but an elf? It's Twinkle. If there's one bright spot to Santa's incarceration by Zinyak, it's that the jolly old elf didn't have to see his best friend in the world turned against him in the holiday's darkest hour. Santa would have been shattered. I wish I could tell you that Claus had coerced threatened or bully Twinkle into allying with the foul creature's plan, but the truth was far prettier than that. Twinkle was simply tired of being the replacement Santa. The elf took to Claus's ca Cla cause with gusto. It was a dark time. Worse still was that Twinkle knew Christmas's one true weakness. He knew the one thing that would ir irreparably turn the tide against Mrs. Claus and the elf resistance. The combo to Santa's safe. It's one two two five. No one's surprised by that, right? Mary's cook Christmas cookie recipe. The secret ingredient is love and bourbon. The North Pole. The source of Santa's power and the most potent weapon in the elven arsenal. Crafted by the shop's most talented elves and blessed by Father Christmas himself, the North Pole is a weapon capable of channeling holiday cheer into a blast of such high intensity it can level a large city in a mushroom cloud of concentrated happiness. It also faintly smells like peppermint. But no one, not Mary, not Santa, not even Blitzer, Blitzen on one of his drinking binges would dare unleash his power, or its power. If the North Pole fell into Twinkle's hands, into Claus's hands, then all would be lost. Claus unleashed a full-on assault. His armies unstoppable. The first to fall were the Snowman Grenadiers, Snowmen are not allowed to carry weapons. It only causes problems. The C Cider Boys Elven Militia? The subject of a short-lived reality show on wealth. The Cider Boys Elven Militia never could do much of anything right. Obviously, the Flying Reindeer. You know Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen? They were the first to die. Claws and his evil army put their heads on pikes and paraded them around the workshop. It wasn't long after that as I would later learn that Claus built his team of mechanical creatures, the Robo-Deer. It wasn't long before the elf resistance and all of Christmas was in shambles. Claus locked Mary away on a remote ice floe and claimed the North Pole for his own, but he was unable to wield it because it relied on the power of giving, even if it was a WMD. But it didn't matter, for Claus was in charge now. The sky over the workshop darkened and Twinkle, that traitor, had become a slave driver. The only hope the world had was to sing a song around a Christmas tree. I'm glad you're able to joke during a time like this. A group of wacky teenagers? Sigh, no. A renegade elf. Tinsel was his name. This lone elf managed to break off from the others and escape the ever-watching eye of Twinkle and Claws. Tinsel went to find help to turn back time if necessary in order to save the holidays and he would find it but not before the entire world got put on the naughty list the Christmas peril Claus had taken over the workshop he had the North Pole in his possession Mrs. Claus was locked away the reindeer were slain Twinkle, the traitor, traitorous lout was working the elves to the bone it was the darkest time in Christmas history, and it was about to get darker. With only hours until Christmas, Claus and his minions didn't have long to ruin the holidays. But they didn't need much time. Claus's first stage in Operation Black Christmas was... a strict dress code for all the workshop employees. But that's not what we're talking about here. Anti-Christmas ad campaign? Claus's twisted operation would only benefit from the months long barrage of Christmas propaganda. An anti-Christmas campaign ad would be counterproductive. Production of dangerous toys. Long gone were the days of dollies and trains. Claus had his elves rebuild the machines used to create toys so they now produced only weapons of war. An army of elves wasn't enough for him. He wanted more bigger, meaner soldiers. He wanted to turn the world's children to his side. After all, everybody still thought Santa was in charge. News of Nick's imprisonment hadn't spread beyond the workshop. 
and that happened decades ago. The people of Earth were oblivious to Claus's regime and his evil intent. Claus was counting on them to do as Santa told them. If Santa gave them guns and knives and nuclear warheads to play with, who would turn it down? Anyone who was sane? Well, yes, maybe. Look, anyway, I think that's one of those where all of those answers would be correct. And so the elves went about making their weapons and deadly toys, and into Claus's sack they went. As the hour of judgment loomed, the spirit around the workshop was dire. No one dared speak up to oppose their taskmaster, Twinkle, or his boss, the vile Claus. Come midnight, Claus climbed into his sleigh and went about his annual route. The robo-deer braying in the cold winter's night, Claus sent an arsenal, set an arsenal into the stockings and under the decorated trees of every household. Not everyone got presents, though. There were those Claus had put on the naughty list. Those people got something much worse. Fruitcake? Hey, some people like fruitcake. Bunny pajamas? They should be so lucky. Eternal torment and pain. Even worse. Those poor souls for unfortunate enough to get deemed naughty by Claus were not simply denied presents or subjected to lashings. No. Claw had something much worse planned for them. On Christmas morning, those who had not made the nice list were seized by mechanical nutcrackers and whisked away to the workshop. They were to become the subject of Claw's grand experiment. He needed those of a naughty disposition to watch soap operas with. He prefers to watch those alone. Scrub the turn uh scrub the robo deer stables. Cleaning the robo deal deer stables is one of the few pleasant tasks at the workshop, since the machines are engineered to turn their grain-like energy source into a custard that tastes vaguely like chocolate chip cookies, or so I've heard, turn into his special soldiers. As it turns out, Mrs. Claus wasn't simply locked in a prison on that ice floe. She was forced by she was being forced by Claus and his crew to create the only word for them is abominations. She is making gingerbread men, not just ordinary gingerbread men made of sugar and flour. These were cookie soldiers, bent on world domination, driven by an insatiable hunger for war. But the gingerbread men experiment was failing. They and they were lacking that special ingredient, human brains. I'm going to look at, see if, uh, this doesn't care if you believe in it. Christmas believes in you. Okay, that that's one of those that... Uh, every answer is the right answer. So I want to see what this says. Exactly, no one. Okay, no good girls and boys. Okay. A full frosted assault. Christmas had not come, and with it, the reckoning of claws. The good were given weapons. The not-so-good were kidnapped by sentient nutcrackers to be turned into malicious gingerbread men. Moms and dads around the globe attempted to take the guns and knives and grenade launchers from their children, but were melt by meltdowns, temper tantrums, and the occasional rude gesture. Gesture. How could mommy and daddy hate Santa? Why would they take his gifts away from them? Without an answer, the parents had no choice but to relent. But this was only the first phase of Claus's pain. The second was enacted on... We'll say St. Patrick's Day. As a longtime fan of snakes, Claus wanted nothing to do with that man. Valentine's Day? No way Claus would wait that long. New Year's Eve, 2013, a day which will live in infamy. A fleet of sleighs, large enough to block out the sun, descended from the northern tip of Earth like a black cloud. No one knew it was coming. No one was prepared. Gingerbread men, crazed nutcrackers, elven turncoats, morphed into giants by Claus's power, and a stampeding horde of robo-reindeer stormed across the land. Scared, defenseless, and more than a little confused, the people of Earth holed up in their homes, unsure of what to do. Little were they, little were they prepared for what happened next, for Claus's last punch in the sack was even more nefarious, more wicked. Claus's master stroke was... Krampus. Krampus has nothing to do with this. Fruitcake. Seriously, fruitcake isn't that bad. An army of children. What no one knew was that those toys that Claus had given the young people of Earth on Christmas morning, the bayonets and flamethrowers and mine launchers emitted a high-pitched noise. 
only perceivable by children that turn them into mindless zombies when triggered by claws. By pressing a button on the head sleigh, claws activated his army. The kids picked up their weapons and took their parents hostage. The grown-ups were forced into large, gaudily wrapped packages, tossed into a large pack and hauled away to the workshop. The nutcrackers set about destroying all that was left behind, smashing cars and bikes, setting homes aflame, with the world burning and its citizens captured, Claus set about on the next phase of his plan. But what Claus didn't count on was... Angel getting its wings? Sorry, Clarence. Not this time. His heart growing three sizes that day? Not unless Claus had been eating a whole lot of bacon, no. A rogue elf. Tinsel. The elf who had thwarted Claus's forces and escaped the workshop had made it to civilization just in time to tell a small ragtag group of regular people what Claus, Twinkle, and the rest of their minions had been plotting. Trekking southward from the pole was no mean feat, but Tinsel knew he must get the message out. He had to let the people of Earth know what was coming, and he knew more than anything the best people to tell were the UN? Following the worst Christmas ever, the the United Nations had temporarily disbanded. NASA? Tinsel thought Nat so was a brand of hot chocolate, actually. The Saints. That's right. The Saints. Well, actually, just one Saint. Me. Obviously, this is by Shondi. <sighs> Tinsel. A big fan of my reality dating show. See? I want to sleep with Shondi. Tinsel was fixated on finding me, both to get an autograph and to help save the world. Not only had Tinsel managed to get away, he brought something with him. A small pouch of Christmas magic. He didn't have enough to just wish Claws away, but he did have enough so that if enough people believed really hard, the magic dust might be able to free the people Claws had brainwashed. It was a long shot, but it was all we had. Of course, the first thing I did was... How about smoke a bulb? No, I didn't smoke a bulb. Sleep with Tinsel? No, I did not sleep with Tinsel. Assemble the crew. Hey, I knew I could handle things on my own, but it never helps to have backup. The first one I called was Johnny. First things first, I wanted to make more than an elf watching my back. Or I wanted more than an elf watching my back. Kinsey was next. She then insisted on calling Keith, Keith David, but no but he was last seen on location playing himself in his own life story and nobody had his number. Ben King had taken the money he'd made on that weirdo sci-fi book he wrote and was on some remote island somewhere. I suggested Matt Miller, but Kenzie shut it down. Apparently she'd had enough of sharing the spotlight with him. Every second we weren't taking action was another moment Claus was ruining the planet. I made the call to bring, one, bring on one more person. Asha? Asha's good people, especially after everything that went down. But I figured we weren't going to get her without Matt being on board. Pierce? Yes, of course. The only person who could possibly round out humanity's last-ditch effort is a clueless, fame-obsessed, off-key singing celebrity of the moment with series, serious boundary issues. The boss. Of course, they spent the first 20 minutes laughing in my face. They didn't even be believe in Santa. They figured Claus was just some crazy alien who followed us home, gave kids a bunch of gum guns, and was now unleashing its armada at us, which, oddly enough, is actually a more plausible explanation. They were down for helping. Anytime shooting bad guys is part of the plan, the boss wants involved. But there's no way they were buying into Christmas magic or elves or any of that. I'd like to think they changed their minds when they saw the Christmas dust. They took a pinch, smeared it across their gums, and declared it pretty alright shit once they met Tinsel. I believe the boss's exact words were, Hey Shondi, is that your little nephew? So no. But they didn't. Of course not. Have you met the boss? Look, I respect the hell out of them, and some... And I'm as loyal as a dog to them, but open-minded, they are not. Once they get some idea in their head, they just... I'm going, to I'm going off point. Anyway, we had our crew, and you know what? It felt good. Me, Kenzie, the boss, Johnny. Lean and mean. Oh, and Tinsel. 
lean and mean and really short. I mean seriously short. He came up to my kneecap. I wasn't even going to think about wearing a skirt around this guy. Sorry, going off top track again. We had the crew. We had some magic dust. We had an objective. Take out claws. How we were actually going to do that, well, that was laid out and ready to go. Since when do we saints ever lay out a plan? That wasn't entirely clear. True, but that will be told in the next text adventure segment. Fourth wall breaking, yay! Operation Holiday Hustle. Claus was holding the world hostage. Tinsel had finally made his way to me with his sack of magic dust, which was only kind of disturbing. The crew, the important parts anyway, had been assembled. We knew we wanted to get an get all those people who had been brainwashed by Claus's twisted presence on our side, and Tinsel assured us that the magic dust could do it. But of course there was a problem, which was... The elf forgot and snorted at all? No, but I kind of think he wanted it to. Hitting enough people with it? Uh... I'm just, uh... Trying to get all the wrong ones. Claus found us first. Nobody finds the saints unless the saints want to be found. Except those times people found us. Hitting enough people with it. According to Tinsel, you have to come in contact with the dust to be affected by it. We only had a little bit, meaning we couldn't waste a speck and no good way of distributing it to a wide audience. Kinsey said she could produce more if she had the components, but Tinsel said that only Santa could bless the stuff. Without Santa, it was just dead skin cells and sawdust. So Johnny suggested putting it into a sprayer and hosing people with it. Not a bad idea, but it was the boss who came up with the best plan. Putting it in the water supply? Yeah, we really didn't have that kind of time. Crop dusting? Yep, it appears... Sometime... Okay. I need to, uh... Gathering everyone at Steelport Arena. Um, how big do you think the Steelport Arena is? Anyway, appears sometime during our presidency, Pierce had the great idea of hooking up our aerial application apparatus to Air Force One. From what the boss said, it was to be part of Pierce's attempt to paint the whole world purple. Our glorious communications detector, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it turns out this harebrained scheme of Pierce's was actually going to come in handy. Uh, through the cover of darkness, we made our way to the hangar. We were quite surprised Claus hasn't set up defenses around any command centers or anything. Whether that was a product of his ego or just an oversight is hard to say. And prepared for our counter assault. We had just gotten everything in order when Pierce appeared in a fit of jealous rage. Ha, huh, no, but man, that's totally something Pierce would do, isn't it? We realize Air Force One is out of gas. Okay, true, it had been out of gas, but we caught that early on, thankfully. Claus's forces attacked us. Tinsel, bless his little elfin heart, wasn't the sneakiest elf in the world. He had been trailed the entire way from the workshop to Washington, D.C. A spy, following orders from that turncoat twinkle, reported back to Claus about our plan. As soon as the hangar doors opened, a fleet of sleighs, each one signaled by the screeching of its robo-deer, descended from the sky. They came at us, guns blazing. We took cover in the hangar and unloaded what we had. I have no idea how long the battle took, but it seemed to last for hours. Gingerbread men, nutcrackers, weirdly tall elves, and mechanized reindeer surrounded us. Our, obvious, our enemy was strong, but we were determined. After the smoke cleared, it was obvious we won. Sigh. It was a draw. The saints don't do draws. Claws won. We were outgunned, outmanned, and had nowhere to run. I grabbed a rocket launcher, climbed aboard Air Force One, and started firing missile after missile at them. Twinkle and his robo-deer-driven sleigh had swooped down and grabbed me. He dragged me up high, high into the sky. I remember the look he had, that twisted grin, that disgusting shimmer in his eye. Happy New Year, girl. He said, then he, he, let's just say that when I, let's just say when I landed on the dirt, I was short one arm. 
that bastard. I was losing blood fast and fading. The last thing I saw was Johnny climbing onto Twinkle's sleigh, and the scream he let out when that elf leveled my arm, still grasping on that rocket launcher right at Gat's face. Soon after it was over, Air Force One was grounded. We were all taken hostage, and Christmas was forever ruined. The planet had fallen to an evil version of Santa and his no-good army of twisted Christmas icons. All hope was lost. We had no choice but to surrender to Claus's will. The world was his now, or so he thought. Last-ditch effort. The Saints had lost. All hope was gone. The world had fallen under the rule of Claus, and not even us Saints could save the day. Johnny was gone for real now. I lost an arm, though Twinkle insisted on replacing it so that I was still useful. Years went by. The boss was locked away in Claus's office. While the rest of us, including the other saints with whom we'd been reunited, were put to work in the mines. Our job, day in and day out, was to collect metals from the earth. All we had to work with were a set of tiny hammers and some thimble-sized buckets. Why Twinkle and his men didn't just didn't make human-sized tools for us, I have no idea. Just another sign of their maliciousness, I suppose. We had attempted many uprisings, of course, but they were always thwarted thwarted by lack of motivation. Overthrowing claws and reclaiming earth consumed our every waking moment. It filled our hearts with fire and our veins with acid. We ate, slept, and breathed of defying that monster. No cause surpassed death and destruction of claws twinkle and everything they wrought. So no, it wasn't lack of motivation. The watchful eye of claws? Surprisingly, we rarely saw claws. Rumors have bounded that he was busy working on some grander plan, some ultimate master phase, but no one knew for certain what that was. That Taskmaster Twinkle. While Claus was rarely seen, Twinkle and his giant elves were omnipresent. Like starving hawks, they watched our every move. We couldn't wipe a bead of sweat from our brow oh, without bringing down their wrath. That didn't stop us. We developed a code, subtle gestures, inflections on certain words that helped us communicate with each other. With it, we were able to devise a plan right under their noses. Their fir the first phase of the operation was to lead a worker uprising. The more the merrier, right? In order to take out Claws for good, we needed to make sure Twinkle and his crew were distracted. It was Pierce who came up with the plan. I know, I was surprised too. It was Asha and Ben who put it into action. Kinsey faked an injury to draw the guard's attention. Ben struck struck from behind while Asha grabbed the giant elf's weapon. When the other guards came running, I rallied the workers. By the time Twinkle and his posse showed up, we had taken the mine. And the giant elves lay at our feet, and the workers stood by our side. We are ready for phase two. Smoking a bulb. I'm going to smack you. I swear to God. Take out the robo deer. As it turns out, the robo deer would be an integral part of our plan. Taking out Twinkle? Damn right, I was gonna get that son of a bitch for my arm. For Johnny. And for siding with Claws and helping start this whole mess in the first place. The workers took their tiny tools and acquired guns from the giant elves. Asha and Ben cleared out the others while I leaped on that bastard Twinkle like a jungle cat. I wasted no time in pummeling Twinkle to a pulp with my last punch, I drove my fist through his giant elf face and into the ground below. With tink Twinkle down, we stormed Claus's compound. See? Thus energized the workers who had been on the assembly line. They took up arms alongside us. The battle of Santa's workshop was long and bloody. Sometime during the battle, I got my hands on a crimson cowboy, the best weapon in the elven arsenal. We were just outside Claus's office when a robo dealer with a glowing nose charged me. I leveled my gun and squeezed the trigger. The bullet bounced off the reindeer's metal hide and landed square in my eye. I went down, but I wasn't out. I rose again, and together we tore Robo Rudolph apart. The path to Claus's office now clear, but we threw open the door, ready to take that monster down once and for all. But the monster's room was empty. Claus was gone. All that was left is a note. Nice try, Saints. You did real well, but I'm afraid you're stuck in this living hell. 
One planet couldn't beat me, don't you see? Now the universe will fall just as easily. By the way, I've got your boss. I'd be lying to say I, I was sorry for your loss. Had been, had all our fighting been for nothing? No, no way. We couldn't let Claus win, but we couldn't let the entire universe fall under his regime. We had to stop Claus, but how? Find a reserve of Christmas magic in the workshop. We looked, but there was nothing left. Wished upon a star? Uh, no. Zinyak's time machine. Claus had been found, or Claus had found Zinyak's time machine and hidden it in the back of his office. I had never been so happy to see a machine in my life. Kinsey would disagree. The machine was mangled, though. Half of it was missing, using parts from the destroyed Robo Rudolph some of which were used to fix my eye, and a little elven ingenuity, Kinsey and Matt got the machine back in working order, but it only had enough juice to send one of us back. Matt thought it should have been Asha. Ben suggested Kinsey, but it was Pierce who said it should be me. Shondi's lost the most of any of us, he said. Huh? Maybe I'd been too hard on Pierce this whole time, I thought. Plus, if she doesn't come back, we still have everybody important. Or maybe not. Still, I agreed. I would make the trip back to my own past. But when? How far back to go? I could have traveled back and warned everybody about the Zen invasion, but I also knew, knew I needed to be able to get back to my time. Also, if we had never been abducted, we wouldn't have gotten Johnny back. So I chose the day before Claus came to power. We would have defeated Zen Yak already and his time machine. But it wouldn't be too late to save Christmas. I set the course, stepped into the machine, and hit the button. And like that, I was gone. But first I need to see the... Yeah, that wasn't a must. The wrong answers. That wasn't a must. That was a must, but that couldn't be our first step. Taking out Twinkle would only bring Claws down on our heads. Infiltrate Claws' office. Not a bad way to start, but no. Okay. Okay. The future. We had done it. Claus had been defeated. Santa had been saved. The boss even learned the true meaning of Christmas. But I couldn't stay. I had to get back to my own time. Not, But not before taking my part in the most glorious montage the world had ever seen. After that, I said my goodbyes to everyone and I stepped into the Zen time machine. I set the machine for the only date I could and pressed the button. In a flash, I disappeared from the past and material materialized back in my present. Back in the present. I stepped out of the time machine to find myself inside a museum. Sometime during the decades since we successfully saved Christmas, the Saints had apparently forgotten that I'd be coming back through that damn thing and stashed it inside a history exhibit. Not that big a deal except for the fact dinosaurs had taken over the planet. No, that DLC isn't officially canon. Zinyak had come back to life. No, though I suppose there's always Saints Row 5, which is apparently coming out in 2020. The museum was closed. Admittedly, not the most epic of options, but yes, the museum was closed for the holidays, which meant I couldn't get out unless I broke the glass with my cyber arm, which I did. The world outside was magnificent. Lights of every color sparkled on the fronts of every building. Children and grown-ups alike were making snowmen on the street corners. From storefronts, I could hear carols and hymns lift... Lilting? I, yeah, lilting onto the street. Christmas, and those other holidays too, had survived. I asked an old boy what day it was, and he told me it was Christmas Eve. There was still time. Still time! Okay, that last part didn't happen. But of course, I had to come back to the day before Christmas. I had to see it. I had to know. Really know. We had won. The first place I went was... Let's pretend... I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. The boss's place? Ugh, have you seen that place? Add a couple more decades of boss to that hole and no thank you.
Johnny's. Predictable, right? But look, after everything we'd been through, and after losing him again thanks to Twinkle, it was the first place I thought of. That would have been proof beyond proof that we really had changed the future. But it was... Well, when I went to his door, he didn't answer. I knocked again. No answer. It wasn't until after I busted down the door, or his door, this cyber arm is pretty awesome, that I realized he wasn't there. No message, no nothing. Feeling saddened and a little bit lonely, I then decided to stop by... Pierce's? Look, I know I'm hard on Pierce and everything, but after Johnny, there's no one I'd rather see than... Sorry, I can't. No way I can even get that out. Get through that with a straight face. The boss's place? No, seriously. I'd follow them into hell, but live with them? No. No way. Kinsey's. We were like sisters, right? I figured if anyone would know where Johnny was, or where anybody was, it would be Kinsey. I took a cab to her inner sanctum and knocked on that big ugly garage door. But again, there was no answer. I thought about ripping it off its hinges. Could my cyber arm even do that? But no. She was probably off being Kinsey somewhere, you know? Kinsey-ish? Or maybe she had moved. I realized then that it had been a long time, and people move, and hell, people die. Maybe there were no more saints. A sobering thought. With nowhere else to go, I went to... Not gonna happen. Oh, come on, visit the boss's place. Ben King's? I actually don't know where Ben lives. He's never invited me over. Huh. My place. I had bought the place outright with the cash I'd gotten from that game show. So I figured if uh, if any place had to be the best chance of still being around, it was my place. I grabbed a cab and headed home. I couldn't believe nobody was around on that, or that nobody was there to greet me. I mean, I told them I was going to come back, or I was going back to Christmas Eve 2035. So you think at least one of them would mark it on their calendar and maybe say thanks, Shondi for warning us about claws and helping turn the tide of human history and also for saving Santa and Christmas and those other holidays too. But no, nothing for one-eyed, one-armed Shondi. After the cab left, I stood for a moment in the cold December air. It was dark out, not a hint of snow. I knew that I should be happy just to be home, but I felt empty, alone, sad. I was heading towards the door when I realized I didn't have my keys. Was I going to have to bust down my own door? Well, it turns out I didn't need to, because as soon as I got close, my house blew up. You sure lo have a love of theatrics, don't you? My cyber arm turned into a lockpick. It's a mechanical limb, not a Swiss army knife. But that would be very cool, yes. The door opened. And there he was. Johnny. That big, goofy grin on his face. And it wasn't just him. It was Kinsey and Asha and Matt and Ben and Pierce and the boss. They hadn't forgotten. In fact, they all knew the one place I would eventually have to come back to. They welcomed me home with hugs and high fives and rounds of Merry Christmas. Kinsey was just telling us about how Santa had given everyone a special present as a thank you when I heard a strong it or a strange yet familiar voice from the kitchen yell, Is she here? A strange vibe filled the room at that point. Everybody hushed, except for Kinsey. Oh, she said. I suppose I should have warned you. It's all right, Kinsey, the voice in the kitchen said. I'm sure she'll recognize me. And into that room walked me. Other me. No cyber arm, no robot eye, no short haircut. I always wondered what I'd look like with short hair. Kinsey did her best to explain. When we saved Christmas, we started an alternate timeline. This is the you that exists without claws and twinkle and all that happening. I admit, it was weird. Like, really weird. But okay. I mean, I was used to hanging out with other versions of me by that point. Hey, let's knock back some nog. What do you say? Typical Pierce. Or at least some eggnog-flavored Saints Flow. So we did. And we talked and laughed and shared stories while outside it started to snow. 
We gathered around the tree and sang carols until late. That night, after everyone had left, and I was snuggled in my bed, I heard footsteps on my roof. And I knew that it... I knew it wasn't the name brand sneakers of gang thugs, or the web feet of some alien race, or the tromping metal of repulsors of robo-deer, but the pitter-patter of hooves and, and the shiny boots of Saint Nick. Tomorrow morning, I'd wake up and see what present Santa had delivered me. Whatever it was, I already had the best present I could ever ask for. The best Christmas ever. The end. And speaking of the end, that is Saints Row 4 completed. So, I guess I'll play Gat Out of Hell next. So, I will see you guys for that. Farewell.